Good morning, everyone. Okay. <laughs> well, um, welcome to Bethel. My name is Michelle. And my name is Tabitha. We are so glad that you have all chosen to be here in the Lord's house this morning to worship. And um, to any of the newcomers, because I can see some new faces, uh, we welcome you. And we also invite you to stay back a little bit longer with us and join us for fellowship lunch. But before we continue with worship this morning, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Our dearest and most heavenly Father, we come here with thankfulness in our hearts, Lord, that after a full week we can be here in your house, Lord, to bring praises and worship to your name and to also hear your word. Father, we pray that as we come before you this morning, may you just help us to stay focused upon you. May you cleanse our hearts. May you renew our minds so that we may be focused upon you. And may you move our hearts so that we may receive your word well. And the worship and praise we bring to you this morning, may it be pleasing to you too, Lord. Father, we want to commit these things into your hands and this time. Through your, most, your son's most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So this morning it is our great joy and our privilege to be able to share with you a little bit about what the both of us have been learning from our theme, Behold My Servant, taken from Isaiah 42. It's been wonderful to hear over the last few weeks from the various chair people about what servanthood means to them and how they appreciate the Lord Jesus. It's been both very encouraging and enlightening to hear from them. Well, as Tabitha already said, um, you know, for the past few weeks, we've been challenged to understand what it means to be a true servant of God by studying the life of God's perfect servant, Jesus Christ. You know, this morning, my heart is just full of thankfulness as I reflect on these lessons, especially as we draw nearer to the Easter season. You know, if Jesus did not do what he did on that cross, we wouldn't have such a privilege to be here to worship God at all, nor to serve him the way we do. You know, the Lord really showed what it means to be a true servant of God by his commitment to God's plan and by his love. Because as we had learned last week, you know, he is the true good shepherd. Last week, we learned about how to discern the heart of a person who is truly a servant and one who is a hireling. If you're not sure what a hireling is, it's just like a, a standard worker or a peon, I guess. <laughs> but when danger comes, the difference is that a hireling would abandon the sheep, but the shepherd would give his life. And what amazes me further is how he would give his life as we learn from chapter 53, in verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. This morning, I've asked for the two optional stanzas to be added to the hymn that I would like to share with you, which is Our God Reigns. You know, as they express these actions of Jesus. The thing is, Jesus could have called a legion of angels to help him. But instead, he fully obeyed his Father's will because he loves us. And without him, we would have no redemption. He is a shepherd that would feed his flock, gather the lambs with his arms, carry them, and lead them with gentleness. And I really appreciate how Jesus also can relate to us, just as a shepherd would relate to his sheep. You know, he bore our griefs, and he carried our sorrows. And he is someone who understands the struggles of life. You know, he wasn't brought up with wealth. He grew up in poverty. People despised him. Even his own family, his own brothers, teased him, mocked him. But ultimately, he would lay down his life for all. And as I reflect on my own salvation, I think of Isaiah's words from chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone 
to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so I see myself as one of those sheep, that little defiant, rebellious smish, the sheep. And then I see the Lord as that shepherd who gathered me into his fold. But it was at a cost. And that cost was for him to take the punishment that I deserved. He would be the one to bear my iniquity. But out of all the grief and the sorrow comes victory. Because of him, we can have a restored relationship with God, our Father, and be part of his flock. You know, in his resurrection, we are given new life. And that same power that made him alive is the same power that can change our hearts. And it's what can help us, help shape us into that true servant of God. And there's no greater example to follow than Jesus himself. And that's why this morning I want to worship the Lord with all of you because we have been given this new life and that we are a part of his flock together. And so we're challenged to be like him, not to be a hireling who bails when problems hit, but to have the spirit of the true shepherd prominent in our lives, not just in church, but in everything that we do. You know, as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Will you follow? So please join me in singing this hymn this morning, Our God Reigns. Thank you. Thank you all for your singing. Um, Michelle and I usually play music for worship, so it's really wonderful to be up here this morning to hear what the singing is like in the congregation. <clears throat> for myself, reflecting on what it means to be a servant of God, the last month's messages have been, you know, overwhelming and incredibly profound to consider. But in all honesty, it's actually quite a confronting thing to think about. Having grown up in church, it's almost like second language for me to pray, to read God's word, to serve him, and to have fellowship. Unfortunately, though, these were things that I didn't know how to appreciate for a very long time. And even till today, it's something I know that I need to be cautious of to seek God, to guard my heart from becoming complacent. Something that Pastor Chris said a few weeks ago that stayed with me is that we won't do something or believe something unless we can make sense of it. You know, without me forming this sentence on my own, I realize that this is actually something I really strongly agree with. The Lord knows that we as humans have our own confusing ways of thinking and understanding. But rather than him pushing us to believe or to make sense of things, he'll let us understand in time. For myself, something that I grappled with to understand or to make sense of was that God would allow me to serve him. My whole life, I worked in service jobs, whether it was in hospitality or retail. And although it is most common for everybody to hate working in hospitality, I actually really enjoy it. I love it. You know, it makes me happy to know that I brought a smile to someone's face for even a short moment, for simple day-to-day -day things like, you know, when I was working at Sumo Salad, helping them pick what salad they wanted to eat, or now in my job, helping people style things or pick out shoes for a dress for their event or their wedding, or helping people pick out gifts for other people. You know, I really enjoy doing this because it's rewarding to me to know that I've made someone happy and helped someone a little bit. However, this mindset to serve happily was not something that came naturally to me with my faith in the Lord and endeavoring to serve him. Unfortunately, I saw serving the Lord as a job with very little reward. And I was really naive to think that because I was saved, all the other boxes would just be naturally ticked off 
without me actually making any effort. Knowing that I had this mindset, this is why it was confronting to look at the idea of servanthood. Because all I could think was, you know, shame on you, Tab, for being so materialistic and for seeing service as a chore. You know, you should know better. But this was the hard reality. You know, I didn't see value in serving the Lord because I didn't love him as deeply as I thought I did. And I didn't see the beauty or the joy in serving him because I couldn't understand. I had a very ungrateful heart and a lack of faith because I couldn't see value in serving him as Lord. You know, thankfully, graciously, the Lord helped me to make sense of why we serve him. To be called a servant of God, it's truly beautiful and humbling. It's an amazing title to be blessed with. You know, it was the title that was given to the Lord Jesus, and it was the title that the Apostle Paul used to describe himself. So how can this title be extended to me? You know, I've done nothing to deserve to be able to serve him. And yet he gives me this chance to try and honor him. You know, to honor him in whatever ministry it may be, or more importantly, to honor him in my life. You know, from day-to-day -day interactions to how I conduct myself, or even in the private thoughts that only I have and I know. It's a privilege to be able to serve him in these aspects. And what's even greater is that his reward is joy, like none I will ever know from serving people. You know, as we draw closer to Easter, it's really important that we each take some time to reflect and to think about what the Lord Jesus means to each of us. For me, he's not just my Savior and my Lord. He is my example of one who served and loved. And today, as we remember Easter, when we um, have communion, Holy Communion later on, I'm personally challenged to grow deeper in my ability to serve the Lord and to do so with even greater gratitude. The song that I've chosen for this morning is HWC number 11, My Tribute. This song really beautifully summarizes how we should respond to the privilege of knowing the Lord. You know, it opens with the song saying, how can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. And you know, as Michelle shared, the Lord Jesus, he loved us, and he did this for us. So how can we not but praise him and to bring him glory? So this morning, may we all rise and sing our closing hymn this morning, um, HWC 11, My Tribute. Thank you all for your singing. You may be seated. And it's my joy to pass this time to Pastor Chris. Thank you. Ladies, well, just a little reminder, those who are uh, in children's ministry, we have a meeting at 1 p.m. Okay, in the junior worship room. Uh, this is for all who are involved in children's ministry. Okay, those who are, this is more than the teachers, and there's a whole group of them. Um, the, the kids that were down here, and we are just grateful that we have a, actually quite a big team of people that is devoted uh, you know, dedicated to constantly be sharper, constantly be more skillful, constantly grow personally in every way aspect. For what? Let's learn how to care for the kids. And that's their commitment, which I am just so grateful for. And my commitment is to be there for them, to encourage, to challenge, right? And so uh, this is what we seek to do every month. Well, this morning we're going to pray together, and then we're going to take up the exciting challenge to read Isaiah meaningfully again. Okay, and I hope you, you try, at least try, right? And then you might surprise yourself that you can actually read the scriptures and it makes sense, right? It has some sense that you say, wow, I didn't realize that the scriptures is so real and relevant. Absolutely. Okay, uh, that's what we're going to try and attempt to do. Okay, well, let's pray together for a while. Our Father, we just pray this morning 
that we would be able to learn and see and listen to how we can understand this whole idea of being a servant of, of God. We confess we don't fully quite grasp it. We have heard this phrase before, but we don't know why it is used the way it is. We pray this morning we would be able to understand it a bit better and to apply it to our life. We ask that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the first thing you got to do is turn to the book of Isaiah. That is your first quest. And if you can do that, not bad. First, you got to find it. Where is the book of Isaiah? In the Old Testament. And then we are going to, right? I know there are many, many chapters and we can get lost in it. And so what we've done is take up themes. And we have been looking at the whole theme of a servant of God, right? What is a servant of God? Okay, Isaiah 41, right? We, we have um, Isaiah 41 in verse 8. You, Israel, are my servant. Okay, now what does that mean, really? It's hard because... We live in a society over here that we don't have servants. Do you have a servant at home? Right? Your washing machine is not your servant. Your husband is not your servant. <laughs> your wife is not your servant. Right? And so we actually don't have... It's hard. It really is. Now, the closer we do is those, we have people from Singapore here, and they have maids, right? Or the Malaysia, and, and it is closer. It's not exactly it, but just closer. And even then, you don't want to think that God is treating you like a maid. So it's very difficult. What is a servant? And so we need the Scriptures to help us understand. And I want to, this is the word for this morning. If we can understand servanthood, this is a word that would stand out to you. You would literally feel privileged. The problem is we don't understand it. You won't feel privileged. You don't actually feel privileged because I don't know what that is. What is a servant of God? How do I understand this? So we are going to take a look at the Scriptures. Okay? And the word is privilege. There is a wonderful privilege. Now, let's take a look at this. Right? In Isaiah 41, take a look. And we read verse 8, Behold, sorry, but you, Israel, my servant, right? Whom I have chosen. Abraham, uh, descendants of Abraham, my friend. What a privilege to come from a line of people who are called servants. Now, this is one aspect of servant, is the idea of my friend. Did you know this? Friendship. It is not, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. That's our idea of servanthood. It isn't. How does God regard servant, my friend? There is a beautiful relationship between the master and his servant in that. Can, is it possible? Friendship. Is that possible? Right? Now, we have a friend in, in Singapore, and she um, you know, works for a company that demands a lot of her time. And she has a maid. And she raised up three boys, husband, just as, you know, it was just difficult to not have a domestic helper. And so they have a person there who is a maid from the Philippines to help her. She does not refer to her as her maid or domestic helper. She refers to her as, this is my partner. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Never heard that before. 
She is my companion. Without her, I would not be able to successfully raise up three boys. Now her boys, one, they all attend good uni and they've graduated, they're working now. And she attributes a lot of it to one who helped her. This is my servant, my friend. She's since retired, this domestic helper, gone back to the Philippines. And every time her son goes and travels for business trip, they will bring all the ang pao's in remembrance of her. Chinese New Year, since you go back to your home now to care for your family, they will bring to her, visit her, and treat her like a family, as a friend. Now that is really special. Can a person who is servant have this friendship, as it were? Now, we read in the scriptures how there was a person who was a centurion that Jesus said, great is this man's faith. Did you know this story? What, did this, what impressed Jesus to say, I cannot find a greater faith than this person? He's a centurion. Not even in Israel. And he tells the people, look at this man. Look at how he cares for his servant. This person went to beg Jesus. My servant is sick. Please heal him. Who would do that? This is a servant. And it's become a friend. You see, it is at the end of the day, not task, but relationship. In the book of Isaiah, here is God seeking to help his people Understand this relationship with Him. What none other than the Lord Jesus Christ was called, Behold my servant. So the word servant is not a bad word. To people, it's bad stigma. I don't want to be called servant. That is like beneath me. It's not a bad word. None other than the Son of God was called, Behold, my servant. And like we say, he is a perfect example. Right? And so this morning, we are going to look at aspects. Look at how God treats his friend. We talk about friend, my friend. Look at, look at this. What is friendship? And I really appreciate this. In verse 9, we read, how the Lord took them, uh, uh, gathered them back together and said to them, you are my servant, I have chosen you, I have not cast you away. He's not going to cast them away. And he says to them, fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, I am your God, I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do we know how to appreciate this friendship offered? See, we all talk, we know we are friends, but there are friends that bail out on us. There are friends that yeah, he's not going to really help you. And here is God, He says, I will strengthen you. You have a friend that strengthens you? You have a friend that says, you know what? I will help you. I will uphold you. And Abraham understood this. Moses understood this. And they were regarded. They are my friends. You see this aspect? Now, here is another aspect. So you've got to go to Isaiah and look at all the different phrases where God says, my servant, and then he will say, my, in this case, my friend. Now, here is another. Okay, in Isaiah 42, And then we read in verse 19, Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger whom I sent? How rich is this relationship of servanthood? One, my friend. That talks about the idea of that friendship, that loyalty to each other. Friendship, right? Two, my messenger. See, this is the idea of 
servant. My servant, my messenger. What is a messenger? A messenger is one who has been entrusted. In the early days, we know this is before the days of email and before WhatsApp came and all the other form of communication. The messengers were used, right? And whether they carry a message from the king, a message from a lord, they will bear a signet ring representing this is genuine, this is the authority, this is a genuine message. Sometimes they carry a scroll with the seal on it. But there are times they carry nothing. That's interesting. They are the message. They have memorized the message, the content. They will not change it. This is from the king. That's incredible. You really got to trust this person to bear your message because you send the wrong message, you're in trouble. A person can take, uh, you know, today, unfortunately, we, we are spoiled by technology. We can't even remember a lot of things. What is my mother's phone number again? See, it's all speed dial. And then we can't remember. And then we, right, you get sent out, go and buy this, 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 this. And then you come back, oh dear. <laughs> Who was that again? Right. And it has happened. Why has it happened to me? Yes. So my wife said, what am I going to do with all these eggs? <laughs> what am I going to do with all these oh, eggs? Wrong. Not a very good messenger, am I? See, you learn. It's not easy to be a messenger. And I look at this, oh dear. It's not, what does it take to be a good messenger? No. Okay. <laughs> First, you, gotta, you, you cannot be blind, <laughs> right? Two, you cannot be deaf. And so this is very interesting. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Now, that is a very peculiar verse. Why would God send out a deaf and blind person? Okay, now how do we understand this? Were they always blind and deaf? The answer is no. You see, what a privilege it is to be servant, you know what, friend? To be servant, messenger. You know what a messenger? The privilege to see what God reveals. The privilege to hear God's word given. The privilege to be sent by God with that purpose. What a privilege. Did they have this privilege? And the answer was yes. Now how come you don't feel privileged? It happens to all of us. When things are given to us, rather than feel privileged, we feel entitled. Don't we? We complain because how come we didn't get this? we can end up with a great sense of entitlement. Remember, Abraham, my friend, descendants of, this is generation. First generation fought hard. Second generation, third generation, now you have all these things. You can end up just feeling entitled, and that's the danger. The children can grow up rather to feel privileged they feel entitled to go to school. They feel that, in, you know, they don't think all these cost money. Every music lesson you attend, every uh, holiday you go on, everything you get costs money. There is no sense. Rather to feel, you know what, I feel privileged. We end up feeling entitled. How come you never get me this? How come you did get me that? How come you do get you this? It's not just children. It can be all of us. Rather to feel privileged to the, country, to the place you belong to, to what you have in life, you just feel entitled. That the government owes you one. That life itself owes you. 
that even God owes you. You see, the danger is we can end up feeling entitled rather than privileged. It is the opposite. And that becomes a real problem. What happens when you just feel so entitled to all these things that you are actually blessed with? Take a look, for example, in verse 20. We read, Seeing many things, but you do not observe. You have so many opportunities to see. God has done so many works. You see many things, but you have lost interest. You don't even observe. You see the problem? How did they end up with spiritual blindness and becoming deaf? It's not because God made them blind and deaf. They made themselves. You have stopped observing. Right? This happened to Israel. They have forgotten the ten plagues, the mighty miracles of God. They have forgotten the crossing of the Red Sea. They have forgotten 40 years of provision. Right? That they did not go hungry. That they did not die of thirst. 40 years. They literally saw many things. What did they learn at the end of the day? They learned how to complain. They complained the food was not good enough. They complained the water is not sweet. They complained, why did God bring us here and give us many difficulties and many challenges that we have to go through? Doesn't that sound like us? We end up with a problem where we should feel, you know what, a privilege to be a servant of God. We end up feeling entitled. How come God didn't hear my prayers? How come God didn't give me this? How come God didn't give me that? How come God didn't do this? How come God didn't do that? We have been shown many things and we observe nothing. See, look at the problem. Opening the ears, and yet he does not hear. What happened? Oh, I've heard it all, year after year. You know, you have the opportunity to hear. And when you stop listening, you actually go deaf. Now, I remember when I, we, I, I brought, you know, Auntie Kath, to go to St. John of God every month. That was tough. You wait for two hours, you get an injection in the eye. I remember those days with Kath. So it would be set aside for, for her, and we, that's why they call us patients. You got to need a lot of patience to wait for a specialist to see you for 10 minutes and put the injection in the eye. I squirm. And, you know, I, I, injection, you, in this case, is not a pun. You cannot close your eyes. It's in the eye. And I remember the many, you know, she, why do you go through? You can't claim uh, Medicare. You have to do this. It's private and, and all those things. And Andy Kaff says, so I could just not completely lose my sight. And that hit me. You know what? I will bring you. It, it's painful, not for me, but for her. I feel that you would, who wants to get an injection in the eye? And she fought hard. She did whatever it is possible. How did I end up visiting her every week like that? Right? I, I asked her one day, you're on hearing aids. You can't really see. How do you clean your hearing aid? And so she told me. She takes a bus. Did you just hear that? She can't see. She takes a bus to Cannington and then goes to see the doctor. And then this person helped see the audiologist. Who? So I asked her, how do you take the bus? She says, I roughly guess. 
and then roughly when it comes, sometime I miss it, sometime it's there, I can wait the whole day, and then some, I don't know how, but I managed to get on the bus. That is, see, this is to me, I see many things. What do I observe? I'm, I'm observing a living day miracle. So I said to her, Kath, why don't I bring you? And there began my journey of learning a lot about eye, a lot about ears. You learn how to take care of the hearing aid, which I know nothing about. You know how come it didn't work in a certain way, better than most nurses, because you've got now eight years' experience under your belt. You have seen enough audiologists to know, you can tell the person, and that is amazing. I respect that. Here is a person who is losing her hearing and losing her sight, and she fights hard to do everything possible that she will not completely lose hearing, that she will not completely lose seeing. And that hit me. It really did. And every time I do bring her, I am reminded, what am I doing to prevent my spiritual sight from fading? What am I doing to prevent my spiritual ears from listening? It can happen to these people who are called friend and messenger of God. It can happen to me. When you stop paying attention, you stop listening. Can it happen? You stop listening to the Word of God. You think you've heard it so much now. You know, your ear, your ears, your hearing will go duller and duller and duller until you hear nothing. Many things are done. You see people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see people who are baptized. You see people serving God. You see, but you do not observe. After a while, you stop seeing, you stop feeling, you stop being even sensitive to God. How bad can it get? Now, let's take a look at this. Okay? Now, in verse 23, and God had to bring this up, and He says, Who among you will give ear to this? If you still got some hearing, listen to this, okay? Listen to this. Who will listen and hear from the time to come? Who will give Jacob for plunder, Israel to robbers? When you lose your senses, you are, an, you are endangering yourself. Both physically, it is dangerous, obviously, and spiritually. You are going to endanger. Now, watch. Who gave Jacob? Now, was it not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned, for they would not walk in his ways. You can't be, because you can't see it. They won't walk in it, obviously, because you can't see, can't hear, nor were obedient to his law. Why? Because they're not listening. Now, look what happens. Verse 25. Therefore, he has poured on him the fury of his anger. Right? You think that helps? The strength of the battle, it has set him on fire all around. And yet, we read, he did not know. It burned him, and yet he did not take it to heart. It can burn you, you can lose things, and you don't even take it to heart. How insensitive can you become? There is the danger. That is a, such a painful description. You become a danger to yourself. You become a danger to your family. You become a danger to your community. You just become a danger. Now, this is something that is just really tough to understand, and yet it happens. Okay? So what can we do about it? Seriously. And I, like I say, I bring up Kath because I've seen the effort she makes to try to see a little bit better. 
to hear a little bit better. And every week, I try to see whether she can still hear when I read to her, when I speak to her. When she responds, I know she's listening. And sometime to my surprise, I show her a picture on my phone. She sees it. She's not lost complete sight. She's only got 10% in one eye and 20% in the other eye. That's what the doctor says. And she continues to come to church. She continues to do, do whatever it takes to see, to hear. This is why many of us respect her the way we do. At 101 years old this April, she presses on. You see, what can we do? We may not be there. Our physical sight, we can still see. One, of the, one day, it will fail us. We can still hear. One day, we will going to need hearing aids too. What are we doing about it? While we can hear, please listen. While we can still see, please see. Now, what if we can't? Now, I'm not talking physical now. What if we really become what it is described here? Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger whom I send? You obviously cannot be a servant at any use if you are blind and deaf. You can't function. You can't be a messenger. When you've seen nothing, you've heard nothing. What needs to be done? Now, this is where it is really, really special. Okay, now I want to really say this. If this is happening, is there still hope? Is there still hope? Isaiah is truly a book of hope. You see a God who truly gives chance after chance after chance. Look what, what needs to be done. Okay? First, it's going to take nothing, and I mean it, nothing except the power of God to do this. Right now, we read this in what the Lord Jesus will do, actually, in Isaiah. In chapter 42, we read how God called uh, the Lord Jesus, right? And then says that He will give him as a covenant to the people, a light to the Gentiles. You need the light of God. Right? Now, verse 7 is what the Lord will do. To open blind eyes. It is going to take the power of God. If you have allowed yourself to become spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, Spiritually insensitive. Is there still hope? It is going to take the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not talking about making improvements in your life. Okay, I'll change the way I do this. I come to church more often. I'll read more of the Bible. You, you know what? You can do all that. You still can't see. It is going to take nothing less than the one who is here to open blind eyes. That's the first. Now, two. What else? Okay. One, he has to open your eyes. You can't open your own eyes. This is a spiritual problem, not a physical one. The Lord has to open your eyes. Now, two, he has to do something else for you. Okay. In verse 16, we read, you have a whole list of I wills. These are promises. Right? Remember this. It's a relationship. Do you want this? God will do His part. What do, what do you want to do? You want to do everything possible? Now, you've got to do your part. What will He do? He's going to do this. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. See, part of our problem 
of why some people have become so jaded is because there is no new experience of faith. You have not had a new experience of faith for the longest time. So you become complacent, you become, you just see the same thing again and again, you stop seeing. God has to literally create a new experience for you. He will bring you and show you things you've never seen before. And I don't know what that is. I know what that was for Israel. I know that was what it was for my life, but I'm not quite sure what that is for your life. It's personal. He almost needs to be that personal rehab person for you. You can, eyes can be opened. You still need rehab to see properly. You still need to work at, how do I see? I need to learn how to see. And so the Lord needs to lead you. Will you exercise that faith? Will you let Him lead you? He will guide you. Will you dare to exercise that faith? To see that which you have never seen before. We need new experiences of faith. Don't bank on your old experiences. See, this is why the way we do things constantly fresh. Our Easter musical is not like the one last year. It's going to be new. It's not like our Christmas. We work at seeing the Lord's grace afresh. We work with new material constantly. And so we have no choice but to constantly exercise our faith. That's how we keep seeing. That's how we will keep li listening. You watch a person that has <laughs> no longer, you know, the, the danger of retirement is this. You, you know, when you are working, you are sharp. You need to read, you need to be in touch, you need to observe, you need to do all those things. The danger is when you don't take it easy, you stop listening, you stop seeing, and it's got to be difficult. You need those new experiences. And the Lord says, I will do this for you. Now that is really special, what He does for us. I will make darkness light before them. Now, it, it really takes God to do this. This is called enlightenment. Where, you, where all you see is darkness. See, you can have a new experience and you still can't see it. You still can't see it. God has to make, bring in light. Can you see it now? And that's what I learned from uh, caring for Auntie Kath, that you need sunlight constantly. It helps you to see natural light. I didn't realize that. How come someday she, it seems to be her eyesight dips? So I panic, call the doctor, is it failing? He says, no, it has to do with the natural light. When it's a gloomy day, you will tend to see less. When you're unwell, the heart pumps blood to your eyes too. So you're going to see less. Don't panic. You need that light. You need an external source. As much as you've got your own normal faculties, you need an external source. And God says, I will make, bring the light. I will make it light. Right? Look at what else. He says, and the crooked places straight. Now that's pretty amazing. Because if you can't see properly, all, the last thing you need are crooked places. You're going to fall down. And He is that gentle, wonderful person who is going to help you restore your sight. He's going to speak. He is going to guide you. Can you hear me? Can you see? And He says, I will do. See, it's the I will. And God says, I will do for them. These are the things I will do for them and not forsake them. Now that is pretty amazing. It really is. What God will do for us. I think we know in the world today, if you are not functioning properly, if you are a doctor and you can't see, you can't hear, you're, you, you have to be made redundant. If you are any worker out there, you will be dismissed. 
we can't use you, you're useless to us, <laughs> sorry, we have to let you go. And so we are always afraid if we have an accident somewhere. We can't, right? That's why we buy insurance, workers' insurance, to make sure if anything happens to us physically, our families are provided. And here is God. He does more than insurance. He will not get rid of you. He's going to help you. He's going to open your eyes again. He's going to do all that. He's not going to forsake you. Look, at, look what, what He does. He will just not give up on you, in other words. And verse 17, He says, You may have lost all your confidence, but not God. God is actually confident about you and says, They shall be turned back. They will come back to me. That's amazing. You're not even confident about yourself. And God, not only does He not give up on you, He's confident you're going to make it. You may come back feeling ashamed, sure, because you trusted in carved image, other things, right? You may feel that, which is normal, but God hasn't given up. He's confident, and He says to these people, hear you deaf, look you blind, that you may see. That is the most gentle way. You know what? He continues to encourage them to hear again, to see again. Learn to listen. I don't know whether we can be that patient with our children. And here is a God that is just so patient. Truly a God of second chance. You have lost your spiritual senses. Spiritually blind, spiritually deaf, spiritually insensitive. And here God says, you know what? He's going to send one who is going to open your eyes. He is going to personally be involved to rehab you, to restore you, to bring your senses back to see again, to hear again. And you may know that great privilege again. He still calls them, even though they were so blind, He still called them, my servant. You don't feel privileged? I do. To belong to this God. To me, it is just such a wonderful privilege to belong to God, to be a servant of God, to be called friend, to be called my messenger, a God who doesn't give up on you and will constantly be there to help you, guide you, even though you have completely squandered your opportunity and privilege. He's still there. This is why we speak of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And our hearts are deeply moved with this understanding. This is our God? Yes. This is what He does all the time. And to us, He is the most wonderful Savior. Let me read this poem for you to conclude this message. This is a beautiful poem that speaks about God as that shepherd for our soul. And may this poem prepare our hearts for communion this morning. It's found in page 9 in your bulletin. Now this poem was written for this occasion, actually for today. Uh, and we are really privileged to have a pastor that writes fresh poems like this. May we never take that for granted. Pastor Charlie will be coming over this month to uh, teach at our church family camp. And I want to encourage you to be there. Encourage you to, to, to listen, to see for yourself. May, perhaps it is God's way of giving you a new experience of faith to help you. Find that spiritual sight back. Spy, find that, those spiritual ears back that you can hear 
the Lord speaking to your heart. And that would be wonderful. Take, take this poem as a beautiful poem. It's called, inspired from Jeremiah 23, taken this phrase, I will gather the remnant of the flock. This is what the Lord will do. Lovingly, the Lord makes reference to His sheep. Shepherds have been entrusted the sheep to safely keep. But the shepherds had failed in the task entrusted. And we can sometimes feel like that. We've had bad experience in church. We've had bad experience with previous shepherds. And we can be so hurt. We feel upset. Now, listen to this. The heart of the Lord was deeply angered and stirred. The Lord Himself would stretch, search for His flock that was driven away. He spared no effort to search for all the sheep that had gone astray. He would gather the remnant of His flock from all countries. They will be brought back to the fold and fed most faithfully. He will bless them so that they would be fruitful and multiply. He would ensure that they would always have adequate supply. He would give them good shepherds who would feed His flock. Tenderly, He would care for them as the great shepherd of God. The sheep would not need to be gripped by fear of predators. They would not feel dismay for the Lord will be their protector. How wonderful to know this wonderful shepherd of our souls. He will fulfill his promises and he would make us truly whole. How do I feel this morning? Privileged. Not entitled. Greatly privileged. To belong to God. To have the Lord Jesus as our great shepherd to have seen how He has blessed, to have heard His Word, and to have your soul constantly enriched. What a privilege. And to me, coming before the Lord's table is a privilege. And this is what we're going to do this morning. Right? Well, let's prepare our hearts for communion this morning. That we have just a wonderful shepherd, savior. What a privilege to be called friend. What a privilege to be called my messenger whom I sent. That has been my privilege for all these years that I have ministered in Bethel. To be messenger. And I don't take that privilege lightly. That's the very thing that challenged me to keep seeing, to keep hearing constantly. Fresh experiences of faith must be there. And to never allow yourself to become jaded, to stop seeing. You know, this word is for all of us. We have a wonderful God. Will He restore, as He say, even to a people who have squandered their privileges. Perhaps you may not give a second chance to this group of people called Israel. But God does. And that to me is an absolute wonderful example of grace. But how must we respond? Here is a beautiful hymn to sing. Would you call out to the Lord? He has the power to open eyes. Would you call out to Him and say, Really, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Don't pass me by. Like that blind man who cried out to Jesus. He cried out with all his heart. He wasn't ashamed what people would say about him. 
he knew he needed to see again. And he cried out. You cry out, perhaps, this morning. And may the Lord restore that sight. This is a beautiful hymn to sing as we have the bread passed around. What it means for the great shepherd who do, to do this for us. He was given as a covenant. This is what the Lord's Supper is. This is the covenant. The Lord Jesus himself established the covenant. The cup represents his blood that sealed the covenant. And when we put our faith in Jesus, that covenant is sealed forever. And the Lord is just so committed to us. He never breaks his own covenant. That's why God didn't give up on Israel. Why? He will still say, no matter how despicable the nation became, how sinful, I remember Abraham, my friend. May the Lord remember you and bless you. Let's sing this beautiful hymn together as we have the bread passed around. Let's partake of this bread prayerfully. Our Father, we just deeply challenged that despite not being able to see and to hear, you will still call us your servant to love us, to believe in us, to give everything you've got to restore us our sight, our hearing, and to help us feel privileged once again to know that we are your servants. What a privilege it is. And we pray this morning that we would not take this privilege for granted. May the Lord Jesus not pass us by. May we cry out to him, to open our eyes, that we may see wondrous things from His Word all over again. May we feel the joy of faith, of exercising that faith. It's been so long. Lord, help us to feel again. Help us to see again. We pray that the Lord will not pass us by but to hear our humble cries and heal us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pass the cup around, we have another beautiful hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. It's another hymn on prayer. It's what Isaiah 41. God does not forget. This is Abraham, my friend. What a friend we have in Jesus that we can bring to Him our griefs, our sorrow, our lack of sight, our lack of being able to comprehend. Can we bring it? Lord, open my eyes. You know what? Bring it to the Lord. Be encouraged to see again. That's what God says in Isaiah. See, hear. In other words, see again. Listen. Do it. Try it. See, I'm here for you. I will strengthen you. I will help you. Don't be afraid. I will lead you. See again. Hear again. Let's sing this beautiful hymn together. What a friend we have in Jesus. Bring it to the Lord in prayer as we have the cup passed around. How wonderful it is to know that the Lord is not done with us yet. We may have lost our confidence because we lost our sight. We may have lost so much faith. The Lord is not done with us. That is just, we cannot find a greater friend, a better friend than the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at those words in Isaiah. I will not cast you out. I, Jesus said, will do this, all this for them. And the Lord will do it. And he says it, 
he will do it. What a wonderful friend we have in Jesus. Indeed. Think about this. Let's partake of this cup prayerfully together. Our Father, we just thank you for the love that we have, we're hearing this morning. We have lost confidence and yet you've never stopped believing in us that you would still speak to us, that you would still show us that you just won't give up on us when we have given up on ourselves we thank you for this precious love that we feel so privileged to belong to you to be your children to be your servants Lord help us to love you to treasure you to rejoice in you every day as we see life now feeling just privileged Privilege for the life you've given. Privilege for the new experience you will lead us to. Privilege to have you help us to see and hear even better than ever before. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's prepare an offering this morning. Well, let's do that with... Really, what we have experienced, what we have seen, and that really, let's never do something without thought. What we hear, what we can see. Let's prepare a love gift for the Lord's work this morning. Okay, while we do that, we uh, prepare to sing our final hymn together. And it is a really one beautiful, moving hymn. 300 and 73 it is found in the hymnal if you want to take a look at that right if you have the hymnal you will see that the author of this particular hymn is by a man that is called uh, right no, over, over here okay well it's really not not this one huh 374, sorry. And it's by a man called George Matheson. George Matheson was a pastor. Now, he was trained, he wanted to serve the Lord. Before he became a pastor, he suffered a tragedy. Now, it was a real test of faith. He was going blind, physically blind. Do you still want to serve God? He was meant to get married to this beautiful lady and she couldn't accept that she cannot marry a person who is blind. And so she left him. It was painful. Needless to say. What would you do? He sunk into depression. God, I wanted to be your servant. How come I am going through all this? in his darkest moment in life. That's where God did something special. We talk about darkness and then light coming. God opened something else. Not a physical sight, but a spiritual sight that he began to see things that others couldn't grasp. He began to see the Lord in the most special, wonderful way. He went on to become a pastor. Well, I think that's to be the most best thing. Cannot see the congregation, you see. You've got to keep on carry, carry preaching. You will never be discouraged. Right? Hey, you know, even if they all laugh, you still don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't that. What was it? That special love that he just felt. And only God can bring on light in such a dark thing. And so he wrote this particular hymn. Oh, love that will not let me go. 
He suffered heartache, love that literally he felt forsaken by his fiance. He felt forsaken by life itself. And that became his prayer. Oh, love that will not let me go. He hung on to God's promises. I rest my weary soul in thee. Can you genuinely say this? I give thee back the life I owe. That in thy ocean depths, it flows may be richer, fuller, be. You mean you can live an even fuller and richer life? Yes. This is called the new experience of faith in what God can do. I will lead you to a place where you have not known or have seen. And so when I sing this hymn now, I'm just deeply challenged in my own faith in the Lord, how He would lead. Let this be a wonderful song we sing. Don't give up when God hasn't given up on you. Cry out to the Lord, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. O light that follows all my way, I yield my flickering torch. We may not have that great light. Yield your whatever flickering flame you have to the Lord. O joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart. Don't close your heart to God, even though you're going through pain. O cross that lifts up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. Don't run away from God. Come back to Him. Let's rise as we sing this hymn together. O oh, love that will not let me go. Let's pray together and ask that the Lord will bless us before we go from here this morning. And now may this great God of love, whom we have the privilege to call our Father in heaven, and we could be His children. And we can learn what it means to be His servant. Enrich our faith with every word that we can hear. With every time we could see. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ enable us to not give up. To not lose hope. But to come back to God again and again. Until our sight our spiritual senses is completely restored. May the Spirit of God enlighten us to see how glorious God really is. That we may behold the glory of God around us now and forevermore. Amen.